Funding for Off 90 is provided in part by the Minnesota Arts and Cultural Heritage Fund and the citizens of Minnesota. Cruising your way on this episode of Off 90. We discover one man's goal to drain a wetland and turn that land into a town. We meet a wildlife artist. We learn about the past, present, and future of Rochester. And we tour an art gallery in Albert Lee. It's all just ahead, Off 90. Hi, I'm Barbara Keith. Thanks for joining me on this episode of Off 90. In the early 1900s, Hollandale, Minnesota was a marsh. Then along came a developer who figured that by draining the marsh, he could create a farming community and take advantage of the rich underlying peat soil. Hollandale thrived for a time, growing sugar beets, potatoes, onions, and other produce. The developer recruited people of Dutch ancestry. He thought they would be good at raising produce in one-time marshes. We take a look at Hollandale today. Hollandale is a little community between Albert Lee and Austin. It originally was a swamp and they drained it, and made it into a cropland and vegetable growing area for the Dutch. Hollandale started in 1918, a fellow by the name of Payne Investment Company, who was a land developer. He was from Omaha, Nebraska, and he purchased Hollandale, which is a 15,000 acres of swamp land. He uh, had some engineers come in and look it over very careful and decided that it would be a good drainage project because it was peat crown after it was drained. They could plant celery, carrots, potatoes, or you name it. To drain a big marsh of 15,000 acres, it takes a large drag line to make an open ditch. Yeah, they dug the ditch all the way from Austin and they drained it with the smaller machines. The machine was a Buckeye road building drainage machine, 76 ton. It had uh, a building on top of it where the crew would eat and sleep and this machine ran 24 hours a day, seven days a week. My father came from Holland in 1909 as a young man. They came to Hollandale in the 20s and we ended up having uh, 11 in our family. So I was born right here in Hollandale. I started at eight out in the fields at eight years old. We weeded onions on our hands and knees and along with us were the migrants that came from Texas or Mexico. I came to Hollandale because I was born here. My dad and mother were raised in this area also. My grandparents came from Holland. 99 to 95% of the people that settled here were of Dutch heritage. Payne Investment Company was a sharp man. Wherever the Dutch were settled, he encouraged the Dutch to come to Hollandale There was a, what they called a bungalow by Geneva Lake, which is just west of town here. If you wanted to buy land, you come to Hollandale to the bungalow and he would wine and dine you there. And the next day he'd take you out early in the morning on a little ride in this touring car, 1926 touring car, show you the land that's being developed and you could just choose what you wanted to buy and most people bought 20 acre plots because a 20 acre plot could support a family. We decided we needed the railroad to come to town because they had to use trucks to ship their potatoes. In fact, they granted two permits, one with the Rock Island from Clark's Grove and one from south of Houndale, which was the Milwaukee. 
and the governor was there and people by the hundreds came. Sixty percent of the people that raised potatoes and onions and carrots sold them to the local Hondo Marketing Association. If a buyer wanted to buy potatoes, he had to come to the association. I was the youngest of 11 children. Some of the older ones were out of the home. My mother had one helper in the house and the rest of us went out to the fields at seven in the morning till six at night. And we stayed there unless it was 100 in the shade or raining. We had a good education. Well, my husband started his own drainage business when he was 17. My dad decided he wanted a little area drained. So finally I decided, well, I'll go down to Pella, Iowa and buy a little tile machine and tile it out for my dad. And then the neighbors came over and they wanted to do some drainage. So for 50 years, I've been draining for the neighbors. My mother was here in 1926 and a big storm came through, like five inches of rain. When you get a five inch rain in this area, we literally can't handle that. So therefore the water sits on top of the soil and drowns out the crop. And that has happened probably five, six times in my lifetime. It was the beginning of the end of some of the farmers. Some of the farmers decided that they uh, wanted to sell their product without going through the association. And so the association slowly faded out. And pretty soon with the floods, had two to three years of flooding and then low prices and no demand for the potatoes from foreign markets like Chicago, they uh, finally sold out. We are now growing corn and soybeans in some of these areas. I'd say the potatoes are probably 50% reduction, onions probably 75% reduction, carrots probably an increase of 30%. Some of the peat ground has deteriorated and has dropped three to four feet. Some of that land is being reversed back to marshes. The DNR is buying it and we're flooding it again. So part of me is sad to see that, but on the other hand, um, we've, had a, we've had a good life and here in Hollandale, I've, I've loved it. Um, great place to grow up and and great place to raise a family. Rory Matson has been painting for more than 40 years. His favorite subject is nature. How convenient that he can just look out his kitchen window and spot eagles, wild turkeys, herons and songbirds for inspiration. He is a classic watercolorist in the English style. He takes his time and loves creating every last detail. Join us as we visit a studio in Albert Lee. The subjects I like most would be nature, uh, just nature in general. Years ago, I was considered a wildlife artist, but I was always kind of a a strange child in that because what I did was more nature art than wildlife art. I'm Rory Matson and uh, live here in Albert Lee and I've been painting for, well, maybe 40, 50 years. My subjects are the birds, the butterflies, uh, the barns, the farm machinery, the landscape of the Midwest. What I see somehow turns into a picture. If this, I know it sounds kind of zen or, or strange, but an example is an egret. I saw an egret on the pond out back here and he was scratching himself. And that turned into a picture. 
Plus, my wife is amazing at finding things that I need to, um, well, she thinks I need to paint. And uh, boy, half the time she's right. We have nature out the back door, out the front door, out the side doors. I paint classic watercolor the majority of the time, the English, classic English style. I use very few opaques, and when I do use opaques, it's because I have no other option. I like detail. I'm happiest when I have a number two, number one pointed brush in my hand and I can do spinals on, on uh, or spirals on uh, feathers and things like that. I, I just enjoy detail. Most people think watercolor is, is not a forgiving media. If you work with it long enough, it's just like any other paint. Once you've developed techniques, you can erase with watercolor. Uh, it down is not done. Art has become a huge part of my life because the best thing that can ever have happen to any artist is when somebody buys your work and makes it a part of their life. That is the neatest thing that ever happens with art. The second thing is, I own a bunch of stuff now. I don't know how it happened. I just woke up one morning and I had huge piles of art material and displays and a trailer and this and that and the other thing. Uh, I literally did. I woke up and said, well, I, I guess I am an artist because I got all the toys. As far as awards are concerned, I have a box. Most meaningful probably, let's see, I got an award at the Heritage in the Twin Cities uh, for Best New Artist. I've got a war, an award in the Kansas City National, the big national show. Anytime they give you an award, it's just a little pack on, pat on the back. It's, I don't even care monetarily because I usually sell enough work that I make a buck here and there. But it, it is nice to, to be recognized. I have a picture in my mind when I begin, and it's, it's already painted in my head. For me, art is a very individual thing. I think it's important. I think it's important because it talks to people's souls. I don't believe anybody buys art because they need it. They buy art because they love it or they want it. I am never totally satisfied with any painting I do. And I learned a long time ago that I never finish a painting, I stop. Uh, I, I'm so addicted to detail that I'll start adding detail where it's not needed. What is neat to me is when I stop at the right place. Located on the Zumbra River South Fork, the city of Rochester is Minnesota's third largest city and the largest city outside of the metro area. It's home to the Mayo Clinic, one of the largest and most well-known medical facilities in the country. We did a little exploring in Rochester to find out its history, how it's doing now, and to learn about its future. Welcome aboard, folks. My name is Nick. I'll be your driver, conductor, narrator, and guide today on the Rochester City and Mayo Historical Trolley Tour. So kick back, relax, and enjoy the ride. Uh, 
1854, a gentleman named George Head came here originally from Rochester, New York, and he brought the name with him because he thought a waterfall in the Sumro River reminded him of the river from where he came in Rochester, New York. Dr. William Worrell Mayo came to Rochester in 1863 as an examining physician for the Union Army. Then over the years, his two sons joined him in his medical practice, Will Mayo and Dr. Charlie Mayo. Their story really started to heat up in 1883 when a tornado devastated most of North Rochester and uh, there was a call from the community for more medical services. The father, with his two sons, asked the Sisters of St. Francis to help take care of the wounded. And coming out of that, the mother superior decided or thought Rochester should have a hospital. But the father really didn't think Rochester was big enough for a hospital. Uh, typically because back then when you went to a hospital, it was to die. You were either sick enough when you went in, you died, or you got an infection in the hospital and died from the infection. But rather than just tell her to go away, he said if she could raise $40,000, he and his sons would staff the hospital. And lo and behold, by 1889, actually shortly before that, she raised the $40,000 and op they opened St. Mary's Hospital. <laughs> Straight ahead is the St. Mary's campus. The building there with the bell tower, that's the Francis Building. That stands on the site of the original 1889 building. Uh, it replaced it. it, was the second St. Mary's Building in the early 1900s. So fairly soon they had outgrown, you know, the original building. Rochester's grown in, in spurts. I mean, it was growing steadily, but not as rapidly as the, 18, at the 1950s when IBM moved here. Eventually, IBM got to be over 7,000 employees. So in the 50s, IBM goosed the population quite a bit. I asked people if they can think of the four industries in Rochester. And of course, the one they always miss is agriculture. Agriculture is still huge in Rochester, and it was even bigger in the beginning. Medical is as a second one. IBM is probably a third, but that's more generalized technology now. They're getting into medical technology, the clinic is. And then the fourth one is hospitality. We've got something like 6,500 hotel rooms for a city of 100,000. That's, that's a pretty incredible ratio. But that's because a quarter of a million patients come through Rochester every year. Kaler Grand Hotel on our right here is on the National Register of Historic Buildings. That, was, uh, that went up in the 1920s. We've had phenomenal growth here. On the 2000 census, we were 85,000 something. And uh, the 2010 census, we were uh, 106,769. So 21,000 people in that 10 year period. So that was amazing growth. And obviously most of that is attributed to Mayo Clinic's expansions. And then of course the support services, the restaurants, hotels, everything for that. Now, at least the state demographers say, and through 2014, we're somewhere about 111,000. So the growth continues as it is. And of course, the projections now with the Destination Medical Center is that we could experience in the next 20 years even more phenomenal growth. We could potentially double the size of this city. So it's a challenge. But at the same time, I said, I think there's probably 98% of the cities in America wish they had this kind of a challenge because it's an opportunity that uh, we, uh, we're excited about, very excited to be able to do that. Uh, it's estimated that there are over two and a half million visitors to Rochester each year. And one last interesting statistic is the number of Mayo employees. Uh, uh, here in Rochester, it's well over 32,000 now, just working in Rochester. Uh, it's over 60,000 altogether statewide which makes Mayo the single largest private employer, not just in Rochester, but in the state of Minnesota. Those initials, DMC, um, is Destination Medical Center. Mayo Clinic has said in the next 20 years they will probably spend uh, over three billion dollars in uh, new developments and projects. Um, they could also um, uh, generate 
another two billion dollars in other private development and uh, so there you got already five and a half billion dollars in new development. The other big district for uh, DMC that's going to get attention right away uh, is the um, it's called Discovery Square and that's uh, really Mayo that's going to be uh, probably some of the biotech biomedicine industries that are many of them are in Boston and elsewhere but uh, to have them here. One of the great stories that uh, it happens all the time, I had a reporter who was from the Wall Street Journal that was here a few years ago. She asked about some things and I said, well, you know, here, somebody, if you're in the subway <clears throat> out on the street and you're asking, how do I get to here or where, more than likely, the person isn't just gonna point. They may walk with you there. In her article that she wrote later, she said, the mayor told me that, but I had it happen to me personally. She said, I went uh, and somebody said, well, come on, I'll show you where. So she said it validated exactly. He didn't just say it because it was kind of cute to say. We are a very compassionate city. It is a city of hope, health, and hospitality. The Art Center and Albert Lee wanted to reach out to people who don't consider themselves artists, but who were involved with the Art Center, to have an opportunity to present their favorite pieces of art. Exhibitors displayed various objects, including paintings, sculptures, and photographs, that not only were aesthetically pleasing, but also held a deep meaning to their owners. The proprietors of the Albert Lee Art Center feel that their space is not just for artists, it's for everybody. Everybody has their own idea of what they like for art. Whether you're an artist or you're a person just walking down the street, everybody has different tastes. We wanted to give the uh, public, uh, the regular members, if they had some artwork that they are attached to and that they want to show it to other people, to bring in a piece of artwork that they can share with everybody else. Everybody has a different idea as to what they like and don't like, and uh, this gives them a good chance to be part of the Art Center and, and display their art. The gallery show is called, These Are a Few of My Favorite Things. I brought the Gibson Girl. It's a painting that was painted in 1907. It was painted by my mother's father's sister. She was obviously taken by the Gibson girl and uh, the Gibson girl was an icon of the time. People looked up to the Gibson girl. She was uh, a woman who had aristocracy but she also had confidence and she was an active person and uh, her hallmarks were her flowing hair. So it's got some history to it and it's got some art history to it and um, it's all part of in the family art. Well, it's a piece I found about 56 years ago on a farm in Iowa, my father-in-law's farm, walking through the woods one day, and I ran across that laying on the ground. And to me, it was kind of a unique piece. I picked it up and I carried it out into the yard. My father-in-law was out there. And I said to him, do you mind if I take this home? He kind of looked at me like, something's wrong, you know. But to me it was unique, and I really liked it, and I took it, I had it for 56 years. And how long that thing had been laying there rotting, is beyond comprehension, and from an old tree that fell down, so it's even older than that, so I have no idea how old it is, but it's old. My artwork is a montage collage, and the reason it's important to me is because it encompasses um, probably from childhood to adult life. The painting that I brought uh, for this particular show uh, is a painting made by a, a Chinese artist. And back in 1985, three Chinese artists were brought to Albert Lee to demonstrate their artwork. I had been asked to videotape the, each of the artists 
and, and make a videotape that they could take back to China with them so they could share, the, share their experiences also. And uh, in fact, the Chinese artist, uh, I think his name is Lu Gash, uh, was painting uh, flower paintings. I thought we were done and he grabbed my shoulder and, and pulled my shirt. The interpreter came over and he wanted to paint me a picture. So uh, that was fine with me. And it's, it's just wonderful. I just, I just love it. So that's, that's my favorite picture. It's been real interesting because uh, there are some big surprises that uh, we've found out. It's really kind of fun to look at and uh, see what the, the story is behind the painting. That's all for this episode. Please help Off 90 meet its financial obligations by becoming a member of KSMQ Public Television. Give us a call at 507-481-2095 or 1-800-658-2539 or sign up online at ksmq.org. Thanks for watching. Join us next time. Off 90. Funding for Off 90 is provided in part by the Minnesota Arts and Cultural Heritage Fund and the citizens of Minnesota.